Hey guys, what's going on? Caleb here. Hope you're all doing well, staying safe. And uh, miss you guys. Hopefully we will all be back together soon. Um, let's dive into it. Today's stories are JSB, pages 62 uh, all the way up through 70. And it's about trust. And now in trust, it's about the story of Abraham and Isaac. I'm sure some of you know the story. And for those who don't, well, you know what? I recommend you read it. And even if you do know it, I recommend you review it because I reviewed it and gave me some uh, some good downtime to think. And uh, yeah, like we're going to dive into it right now. Um, what do you think trust means? Yeah, hard hitting question right off the bat. What do you mean? What do you think it means? To me, it means uh, many things. Uh, I think it, to me, the biggest thing is it's a bond. It's a bond that you share with God, a bond that you can share with your friends, your family, your significant others, anything. Just knowing that they always have the best interest in you, that they always have your back, and that uh, and that they're always there for you, no matter what. The present. God knew that his secret rescue plan could only work if Abraham trusted him completely. God had to make sure Abraham would do whatever he asked. So a few years later, God asked Abraham to give him a present. Now Abraham liked giving presents to God. He gave God his animals. They were called sacrifices. And they were a way to say, I love you to God. But this time, God didn't want a lamb or a goat. God wanted Abraham to give him something more, much more. He wanted Abraham to give him his son, his only son, the son he loved. Isaac, put this boy on the altar and kill him as the sacrifice? How could God want him to do such a terrible thing? Abraham didn't understand, but he knew that God was his father who loved him, and so Abraham trusted him. Early the next morning, Abraham and Isaac set off. They climbed the steep, stony trail up the mountain. Isaac carried the wood on his back. His father carried the knife and the coals. Papa, Isaac said, we have everything except we forgot the lamb for the sacrifice. God will give us the lamb, son, Abraham said. They built an altar and laid the wood on top. Abraham asked his son to climb on top of the wood. Isaac didn't understand, but he knew his father loved him, and so he trusted him. He climbed up onto the altar and Abraham tied his boy to the wood. Isaac didn't struggle or try to run away. He just lay there quietly and didn't make a sound. Everything was ready. Abraham took the knife. Tears were filling up his eyes. Pain was filling up his heart. His hand was shaking. He lifted the knife high into the air. Stop! God said. Don't hurt the boy. I want him to live and not die. I know now that you love me because you would have given me your only son. Well, Abraham felt his heart leap with joy. He unbound Isaac and folded him in his arms. Great sobs shook the old man's whole body. Scalding tears filled his eyes. For a long time, they stayed there like that, in each other's arms, the boy and his dad. Suddenly, Abraham saw a ram caught in some brambles. The sacrifice! God had given them what they needed just in time. The ram would die, so Isaac didn't have to. And so Abraham sacrificed the ram instead of his son. 
and as they sat there on the mountain top, watching the embers of the fire die in the cool night air, the stars above them sparkling in the velvet sky, God helped Abraham and Isaac understand something. God wanted his people to live, not die. God wanted to rescue his people, not punish them. But they must trust him. One day, someone will be born into your family, God promised them, and he will bring happiness to the whole world. God was getting ready to give the whole world a wonderful present. It would be God's way to tell his people, I love you. Many years later, another son would climb another hill, carrying wood on his back. Like Isaac, he would trust his father and do what his father asked. He wouldn't struggle or run away. Who was he? God's son, his only son, the son he loved, the Lamb of God. Now, on the story side of it, why do you think Abraham trusted God so much that he was completely ready to sacrifice his own son? And, uh, like, these questions I'm asking you before I actually answer that, just please go over them again with your family, your friends, with God, whoever. I recommend it. And now, sorry to get back into that. Why do you think uh, uh, Abraham trusted God so completely that he was ready to sacrifice his own son? Is I believe Abraham was willing to go to great lengths for God. And that's what, and that's how we all need to be. He was ready to go to the top of the pole to sacrifice his own, his own son for God because he knew God had something planned for him in the best interest. Now, that's the way I view it. And there's many other views and answers to that question. But now, on the flip side of it, do you think it's hard to trust God? Why or why not? For me, yes, I think it is hard. Um, it's very hard because sometimes it comes down to very, very hard decisions that you have to make. Like, for instance, we'll go back. Abraham was asked to sacrifice his own son. Now, that's big. I'm not saying you're going to have to make that choice ever. But something like that makes it hard to trust God. Like, why, why would you want it for me to sacrifice my own boy? But, again, there's a greater plan. And I'm hoping that makes sense. So, yeah, going back to it, I think it's hard to trust God. And... At the end of the day, as hard as it is, he always is looking out for you. And he will always be there for you, no matter how hard or how easy it is. And now one final question for you. Actually, we're going to make us two final questions. Um, if you can find another answer, please let me know. But who else in the Bible had to sacrifice their own son that was actually sacrificed? The one that comes off the top of my head is Jesus. And, uh, well, we all know there is a great sacrifice for that and why that happened. And if you know another one, please let me know. And another hard one for you that I want you to think about is who can you trust and why? Because you got to be careful, right? You got to make sure it's like God... When you trust in God, he will always have the best interest in you. Or you trust your family because they've been there and they've taken care of you. Even your friends, they're always there. But just who do you trust? Think about it. Talk it over with your your mom, your dad, whoever you like. And you know what? That That's a wrap. Stay safe. Stay healthy. God bless and have fun.
Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's a great night for you not to be here. We, uh, we're a little silly tonight, but we're excited that you've joined us. We're excited that we're able to come together as the church. And you know, it's the beginning of May, and it's kind of a cold beginning to the uh, month of May. Uh, and so I read an article this week, and, uh, and it uh, talked about how there's actually scientifically proven that there's warmer parts to be in the building. And so what it said was that if you choose to stand in a corner, it'll always be exactly 90 degrees. So something to think about. There you go. So glad you could join us. So glad that, uh, that the church is still meeting, whatever that may look like tonight. So we're kind of on our own tonight, but just want to remind you that we still have services on Sunday. We're limiting them to 10. Uh, but please don't feel like you can't book a seat because you're worried about taking a seat from someone else because we'll just keep booking groups of 10 uh, until it gets dark. And so if you, ha if you feel like you need to be part of the gathering, if you feel like you want to be joining us in person, if you feel that's a safe thing for you to do, please go online and book a seat or two or three, however many you, meet and you need. Uh, and uh, we'll just kind of keep opening services up as long as we need to. So I uh, just want to encourage you, if, if you're able to come and you want to come, Please don't feel like you can't. 10 is allowed, and 10 is what we're doing on Sunday mornings. And so, uh, you know, we, we, I, I, I hear that a lot from people saying, I'd like to come, but I don't want to take a seat from somebody who really needs it. I would argue we all really need it. And if you feel comfortable coming, absolutely book a seat, and we'll make sure we have one for you. And uh, a few other quick announcements. Just uh, one is about e-transferring. And so Sharon has decided that she's sick of uh, putting in all of your passwords separately. So you don't need to do that anymore. There's a new way of doing it where you won't need to register a password. And that's probably a good thing because I had Sharon send me the top five most popular passwords that you guys have been using. And, and to here they are. Number one is password. Clever. Number two is password using a zero instead of an O in the word word. So that's pretty good. Number three, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, number four is QWERTY, and number five is Dutch for life. And so it's probably a good thing that we're not going to require you to make up a, a security question and a password anymore because uh, you're not fooling anyone. Let me just tell you that right now. So you'll just notice that slight difference when you go in. You won't have to do that process. And most importantly, Sharon won't have to read your email. That's a key piece as well. And uh, finally, just one last reminder, just around Feed the Need. Uh, Feed the Need is a, still our initiative here where we just want to make sure that as a church, we're doing more than feeding you spiritually. We want to make sure that we're helping to reach all of your, all of your needs and all of your goals. And so, again, we, we often say this. If you see a need, please tell us. Let us know what's going on. We'd love to help. This week alone, we had uh, an opportunity to, to buy and deliver some groceries to somebody who is currently at home because they have COVID. That's a blessing for them, but it's a blessing for us to be involved as well. We were able to provide some funding for some uh, crisis counseling this week such an important thing we know mental health is just uh, a very real threat to a lot of people right now uh, because of a lot of the closures so if you know of something going on please allow us to help please just let us know what's happening we'd love to just be able to join you in partnering and just feeding that need for people in our community no matter who it is in our community it doesn't have to be somebody who comes to Kingsway if you know of a need let us know we'd love to be a part of that as well and uh, beyond that just excited that you're here tonight this morning next week whenever you're here we don't know but we're glad you've joined us and we're excited to uh, worship with you right now. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. This is one of the most favoritest times of the week for all of us, I think. Especially lately, we get to praise God. We get to hang out with you online, wherever you are. And we get to sing together to glorify and celebrate our wonderful and amazing Father. Paul wrote to the Galatians, warning them not to give up their freedom in Christ. The freedom he gave us by dying for us. I feel like Paul is writing to all of us. In Galatians 5, it says, So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and you don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. Let me repeat that. So Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and you don't get tied up again in the slavery to the law.
says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again as my Savior. Working all things out, you're working all things 
for you are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble and you surround me with songs of victory.
Heavenly Father, <laughs> thank you that we can call you Father. That you've made us your children, that you've adopted us into your family, that you've forgiven us, that you've made us righteous. Jesus, your sacrifice for us it truly is, truly is incredible. I'm grateful for it again tonight. Father, we honor you as the all-wise God of this universe. Matchless, wonderful, beautiful, powerful, the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. Your throne above every throne, surrounded by worshipers in heaven right now, joined by these worshipers here on earth. We honor you. We honor you. Holy Spirit, I just ask again, as always, that you'd speak to our hearts. Would you give us ears to hear what you're saying? Would you give us courage to be obedient, to walk out as you direct us, as we follow you? May you shine through us. May we reflect your glory to the world around us. Those are things that we cannot do without you. So would you fill us again with you? Would you fill us again with your love? God, do in us right now what needs to be done that you might be able to move through us as you desire and as you've planned. Grateful, grateful. God, I just pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Thanks to our uh, musicians, worship team. Appreciate you guys. Thanks to our media team back there. Uh, just welcome to those who don't know me. My name's Mark, um, and uh, grateful to have a chance to share with you tonight. Uh, I love how people have been encouraging me with scripture lately. Um, today was probably one of my favorites. Someone sent me um, uh, just a scripture that just said, you know, um, it, it's okay if you cry because Jesus cried too and sent me Jesus wept and said, I hope you're encouraged. <laughs> so uh, uh, I just love being a part of this family. Um, you know, just, uh, just uh, grateful, grateful. So uh, tonight I just wanted to start with this thought. Do you ever find it tricky knowing how to make decisions in this life? Do you ever find it tricky knowing how to make decisions in this life? You know, uh, we play this card game at my house called Exploding Kittens, and many of you are like, of course he does, right? Like, but Exploding Kittens, is, it's a real card game. Uh, I didn't make it up, uh, but it's pretty awesome. And there's all of these cards, and one of the cards you get to play simply says, see the future. And you get to look at the pile and see the next three cards to see what's, what's coming up. And I wondered, maybe like, maybe like me, I, like, I wish I had one of those cards in real life, like that I could see what's coming up in the future. What are the next three things that are going to happen? If, if I do this, what's the next three things that are going to happen? Um, maybe for you, like, you know, huh, I wish I had a crystal ball, you know, that I could know. What happens if I date that girl? Or like, what happens if I buy that house? Or what happens, like even not big stuff, like what happens if I just sleep in today? What happens? And maybe you wish you could see the future. You know, as a disciple of Jesus, the decisions that we make as his followers, you know, as I, as I read through scripture, I often look at Jesus and I'm like, man, there's so many times I'm just not like him yet. And then I read about all the people who followed him around, like his disciples. I'm like, yeah, I'm like those guys, you know, and so there's, there's, well, there was hope for them. There's hope for me and hope for you, I believe as well. And as, uh, as this, this week, just uh, spending time in, in scripture, it's just drawn back and day after day to uh, this man named Peter. And uh, I, I just wanted to spend some time sharing some of the stuff that I learned just about, the, about some of the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples, and specifically Peter. There was a conversation that Jesus had while they were on a road trip, just him and his disciples going north, northern uh, Israel. And, and here, Matthew 16, if you have your Bible, grab it. Um, I've been using like my old paper Bible again uh, recently. That way, I don't get texts while I'm while I'm studying and, and and not get distracted. And it's been it's been wonderful. But go there with me, whether that's on the pa on paper or in your you know on your device. Matthew 16. I, I don't want you to miss what this 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 story. And we're gonna we're gonna take a, a good chunk of it to look at this uh, today. So when Jesus it says in verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, real place, real people, he's in this place and is named after Caesar, uh, and, and um, he's, he's there, as he's, 
and he asks his disciples this question, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Can you picture Jesus there with the, with the 12? He's like, hey, fellas, you know what? Who, do, who does everyone else say that I am? And uh, verse 14, they answer him. They said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist, but we know that's not possible because you, you, know, you guys were at the same river at the same time. But, you know, some say you're Elijah. You know, some others say you're Jeremiah. You're one of the other prophets. Come back again. That, that's, what the, that's what the talk around town is, is that the, you're, you're one of those guys who's like reincarnated. You know, I wondered, like, what if we asked that question today? What if Jesus was, you know, with you and your posse, and he's like, hey, uh, hey, who do you and your friends say that, that I am? And maybe today the answer would be, well, like, yeah, he's a good man, you know, or, yeah, he's a good teacher. He says some good stuff. Or, you know, I, Jesus is a good meme for a rainy day, you know? And so I saw some of these memes that, uh, you know, like this, you know, so he's like, you know, Jesus is talking, you know, you got served, and he's like, and I'm like, bro, you know, the Son of Man didn't come to, to be served. He came to serve. And then, and then I saw this when my daughter sent it to me. She's like, Jesus is like, hey, what is this? And you're like, you know, those are like maybe, maybe that's your experience with Jesus. It's like, you know, some memes that make you chuckle. But Jesus had much more in mind that day, and he has much more in mind this day. Verse 15, he asked them, he says, okay, that's who people say I am, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And it's Peter who answers. He says, I know the answer to this. You're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, Simon, you're a blessed because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You didn't learn this from any human being, he says. You can you picture that moment? Here's, here's Jesus saying, okay, guys, so who do you say that I'm? And Peter's like, yeah, you're, you're the Messiah. And Jesus says to him, whoa, Peter, hold on a second. Do you realize what just happened? You just heard the voice of your heavenly father on the inside. Nobody taught you that. Nobody taught you that. That's what you got from him. You know, everyone else around, like we just heard, they're not all thinking like this, Peter. Everyone else, they're not thinking the same as you right now. You just had a God thought. You know, I know that we live in the, um, like, the everyone else is doing it generation. I think that's been every generation. I, I don't know, maybe as a kid, you were like always asking your parents, hey, can I go to that party? And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, everyone else is going. Or, you know, hey, can, can I get this, you know, this, this uh, music? And they're like, no. Or can I watch that movie? And like, you know, no. And like, well, everyone else gets to. And now as a parent, you know, you hear that, you know, can, can we go to that party? Well, I guess nobody's going to parties right now, but everyone else gets to. And I think about moms everywhere. And what do moms everywhere respond to that question? When they say, everyone else is doing it, what do the parents say? <laughs> Lily's definitely a parent. If everyone else was going to jump off a cliff, would you? The everyone else generation. And, 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 and Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you might live in the everyone else generation, but you just had a thought that everyone else doesn't have. You just thought something outside of the everyone else. And to be honest, I think that each of us right now is living in a time where we need to be able to hear thoughts outside of the everyone else. I think it's so important for us to be able to hear his voice and know when it's him. And I want to try and uh, help uh, tonight to just encourage you, encourage myself as we learn what that sounds like and what that looks like. Matthew 16, it carries on. Verse 21, we're actually going to skip a couple verses. Matthew 21 or 16 verse 21, uh, they're still on this little journey, but Jesus begins to tell them, it says this, from then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he would suffer. Now they knew he was the Messiah, he was the anointed one. He says, but now they said, he said, I'm going to suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders. So just remember that suffering. He says, then, then, from the leading priests, from the teachers of religious law, he said, he would be killed not only suffer, he's going to die, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. So he's telling the fellows, he's like, hey, guys, let me just predict what's going to happen here. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And I'm going to be raised from the dead. And you think about those three things. If he could pull that off, that's pretty impressive. But some of you are thinking, you know what? He could have, he could have planned some of those things to happen. Like he could say, hey, I'm going to do this and make it happen. For instance, you know, suffering at the hands of the elders and leading priests, you're like, all he has to do, you know, is go and those same, le those same religious leaders are like, just call us a brood of vipers one more time. Just one more time and we will make your life miserable. And he'd be like, yeah, I read brood of vipers. And then, and, and cue the suffering. But then, you know, maybe he could have set up how he was going to get killed. I mean, other people have done it. 
I was reminded of this story of a guy who gets to heaven and he's at the pearly gates meeting St. Peter. I don't think that's how it goes, but you know, this is how the story goes. And as he gets there, you know, he gives Peter his name and Peter's like, oh, you're not on the list, but I don't have like, I don't have the most updated uh, list yet. So just wait here for a couple of minutes. Let me just re, you know, reboot this thing and see if your name comes up. And so while they're sitting there waiting, he asks the man, he's like, well, while we're waiting, have you, like, have you done any good deeds while you were down on the earth? You know, so we can kind of look at some of the other, the, the other blessings here. And, um, and uh, the guy's like, well, he's like, there was this one time. He's like, I saw this girl. She was like getting, like, um, she was getting harassed by a biker gang. And so he says, so, uh, he says, so I just went right, right up there. I was like, this isn't right, you know. And I stood up to them. I said, hey. And this big leader biker guy turns to me, and he's got tattoos everywhere. He's got a chain from his nose going to his ear. He's got a lead pipe in his hand. I went up to him. I'm like, he's the biggest, toughest. I said, hey, you. You better stop harassing this girl. And then I grabbed that chain. And I just ripped it right out of his nose. Peter's like, whoa, that's amazing. He's like, when did that happen? It's like about two minutes ago. And for some, for some of you are like, yeah, you could plan, you know, you could plan your own death if you wanted to. You could say, this is how it's going to happen and make it happen. But can you plan rising from the dead on the third day? We can't even do that with our modern medicine right now. That's just not happening. But it happened. It happened. And there was eyewitnesses who saw it happen. They saw him risen from the dead on the third day, just like he said. They were men who uh, wrote uh, of this fact that they had witnessed. It was the reason why they wrote what they wrote. You know, Matthew and, and John and, and, and Mark wrote what Peter had seen. And, and Luke said, let me find all the eyewitnesses. I, I want to, this, is in, this has got to be told. There has never been anything like this. These were men who were terrified the day Jesus died. And just a few short days later, they're all of a sudden full of boldness. Why? Because of someone they saw risen from the dead. The eyewitnesses who gave their lives, they died for this truth just simply because they believed that a man rose from the dead they were willing to give their lives for it it's incredible incredible so Jesus is predicting all this he's telling his disciples you know hey this is what's going to happen to me man I'm going to I'm going to suffer I'm going to die and I'm going to be raised again on the third day and Peter's like you know Peter again he just he grabs Jesus and he says he took him to the side verse 22 but Peter took Jesus aside and he began to reprimand him for saying such things I'm like Peter, you just said this, this is the Son of God, and now you're going to reprimand God. I, that's not wise. But here's Peter. You picture it. He's got Jesus kind of to the side. He's like, hey, hey, Jesus, heaven forbid that that's going to happen to you. That's not, that's not, this will never happen to you, Jesus. What are you saying? And before we get too uh, heavy on Peter, how many times have we said things that we think, you know, the, the, that's the will of God, but we don't a- haven't actually considered what his will is? How many times have we said, well, God's will is this, or God's will is, is that, or God just really wants me to be happy. You know, God's main goal is that, or Jesus, he wouldn't do that, or, you know, Jesus would do that, so, so you better do it too. How many times have we done that? Well, here's Peter saying, you know, as Jesus says, hey, you know what? The plan is that I'm going to suffer, that I'm going to die, and I'm going to raise from the dead. And Peter's like, no, 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 that that can't be God's plan. That's not the plan. And here's what Jesus responds to him. Matthew 16, verse 23. Peter, or Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. Can you picture that? I'm like, here's Peter taking Jesus off to the side, and he's whispering in hushed tones, hey, Jesus, come on, don't say things like that. You know, that's never going to happen to you. And Jesus loudly says, get away from me, Satan. And all the rest of the, you know, the 11 who are just like, what are Jesus and Peter talking about? Then they're looking like, oh, man, what, what is going on over there? I don't know, but Matthew, write this down. We're going to want to remember this. And, and, and we know that it was loud enough that they heard it. Get away from me, Satan. And I was reminded, you know, of this uh, because we've been talking about that recently. You know, here's Jesus living out that, that idea that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. He, he's, not, he's not telling off Peter the man. He's, telling, he, he's going to the enemy that is behind him. He's saying to the enemy behind Peter, the enemy that's using Peter's words in this moment, he's saying, this is not a flesh and blood um, battle. I recognize where it's coming from, and it's coming from the enemy. You know, that's what Paul said to the Ephesians. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not against, you know, other people, the people on Facebook. and We're not fighting against people. 
But we are in a war, and there is evil spirits, there's dark powers, there's mighty rulers of darkness, Ephesians 6.12 says, and, and Jesus is simply recognizing that. As Peter speaks these words, Jesus is like, wait a second, there's something behind that, and, and I don't like it very much. You know, I remember as a, as a child, as a teenager, I, I was mouthing off to my mom one day, um, and, I, and all of a sudden she just looks at me straight in the eye, and she points it, and she's like, I rebuke that spirit of rebellion in you in Jesus' name, and I'm like, Wait, what? Like, um, a parenting hack right here. You know what? You want your kids to behave? Just start casting demons out of them right in front, in front of them. I'm like looking at myself like, wait, what? I, I don't want to have like an evil spirit in me. And I was like, it totally changed the, the, the conversation. It totally changed the, the moment. And, and it made me start looking introspectively to what am I allowing in my life? And so that's just kind of a free parenting tip. But I give no guarantee and no warranty on that, whether that will work for you or not. But it worked for me. You know, my mom saw what was going on behind just this, this um, person. Matthew 16, verse 23, Jesus also says, when he, he turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. Why does he say that? He says, you are a dangerous trap to me. Peter, <laughs> he looks and he says, this line of thinking is it's, it's a dangerous trap. The word, um, that, that trap, is, is the word scandalizo, which can be translated, it's an offense, or it's offensive, or it's, it's offended. That, that word for them was used to, to um, describe the bait stick of a trap. It was like the thing that you went for thinking, oh, this is good, and then the end result of it isn't. The bait is good, but the end result isn't. And that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. He's like, Peter, that line of thinking that I'm not going to have to die, I'm not going to have to suffer, that sounds good. But it is, it is a trap for me. And I think, what if Jesus had gone along with Peter's line of thinking? What if Jesus said, you know what? <laughs> it's true. It's true. And Peter's saying, no, no, Jesus, you don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. Jesus goes along with that. There's no death. There's no resurrection. There's no salvation for Peter. There's no salvation for us. And so Jesus' response is, and I, he's like, not today, Satan. I love one of our uh, friends from our church, Michelle. She, she would uh, remind me of this. You know, she's like, when the enemy comes at me, I'm like, not today, Satan, not today. Maybe we got to learn how to say that a little bit more often. That when we see these things, this bait that sounds good, it even sounds Christian-y, it sounds godly, maybe it's even coming from a Christian brother or sister that you see beyond what it really is. And be, not today, Satan. Not, not today. Not today. You know, I hope you'd have the boldness to do that. You know, because there's going to be people who say, hey, you should do this because that's what Jesus would want you to do, even if Jesus hasn't said it. And that you would have the boldness to see truth for what it is and say, you know what? Not today. Verse this in 23, continues, Jesus returned, he turned to Peter, he said, get away from me, Satan. Not today, Satan. You're a dangerous trap to me. And he says to Peter, you are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not God's. Peter, you're seeing things from a human point of view. And I'm like, man, isn't that the easiest way to see things? Like for myself, for you, isn't, isn't that the easiest way for us to see things? Like we're human, aren't we? Of course we're going to see things from a human point of view. But as you, know, as you study Scripture, you see all throughout Scripture over and over and over again where God calls people not to look at things through a human perspective because there's something bigger going on. For instance, when Samuel was choosing David, he said, you know, Samuel's choosing the king and he sees this guy, he thinks he's awesome, and, and God's like, Samuel, men look at the outward appearance, but I'm looking at the heart, so look with my perspective. And they choose the guy who's the youngest. He doesn't even look like a king, but he turns out to be the king, uh, uh, the most famous king of all of Israel. You know, I was reminded of Elisha and his servant when he woke up one day and the servant looks around and their, their, their whole village is surrounded by chariots and horsemen and they're coming for them, just the two of them. And he's terrified and he says to his master, Elisha, Elisha, the, 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 the army is great. And Elisha gets up and he looks around and he's like, oh, dear Lord, open this guy's eyes, please. And all of a sudden, his servant's eyes open. And what does Elisha say? Hey, beyond them, do you see what's right around them? It's the army and chariots of the Lord. And our, those who are for us is greater than those who are against us. You need to see it from his perspective. You know, all the way through, it would be like, don't look down on people just because they're young or just because they're poor or just because they're lost. Look at people through God's perspective. And that's my question for us. Have we taken the time? Have we taken the time to consider God's point of view? Or too often are we like Peter that we just default to the human point of view. 
the human perspective? Have we considered God's idea versus the world's idea? Have we considered God's direction versus the world's direction? Have we considered God's solution to problems in our lives versus the world's solutions? Have we considered God's wisdom versus man's wisdom versus worldly wisdom? Have we spent some time even considering it? And so the challenge and the question tonight is how can I see God's point of view? How can I, being human, see God's point of view? I'll just give you three thoughts to consider tonight. One is you can see his point of view through his spirit. You know, Jesus promised that his spirit would lead and guide us into all truth. He's like, I got something that's going to help you. It's a someone that's going to help you. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and he says, we are, in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, you can check it up. He says, we are actually one spirit with the Lord. So when, when he moves in, he takes over your spirit and the two of you, like, it's like you can hear his voice. And many of you have said that. You know, I was just reading, I'm memorizing Romans 8 right now, and I got to the verse in Romans 8, verse 9, where Paul just simply says, if you don't have his spirit living in you, you're not his. If you don't have the Holy Spirit of God on the inside of you, you are not a Christian. He says clearly that let that be an indicator to you. If you wonder, man, I would be telling you tonight to say, Lord, God, I thought I was, but, but I'm not. Would you, would you come and move in? Help me hear your voice from in here, not just, you know, the words pastors say or whatever. I need, I need you on the inside. The voice that comes from within, I've heard many talk about that. It's like this unction on the inside. You know, you have a decision to make and you get this little gut feeling on the inside. I remember years ago, and I've shared this lots of times, I've had this throughout my life, but I remember wanting to go and uh, own a Tim Hortons and thinking, you know what, I'm going to go to business school and, what, you know, there's a guy in our town who was like talking about, you know, the, the idea of maybe me be, helping be a manager at one of his stores until I could figure this stuff out. And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then I get this unction on the inside. There's a little hesitancy. No, 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 no. Just wait. Just wait. You know, many of you get those things where you get that gut feeling on the inside. You're like, ah, should I do this? And you're like, ugh, there's something there. Can I just tell you, that's how Holy Spirit works. He works through that gut feeling. He works through that still, small voice. It sounds like your thoughts, but it's a thought that maybe you wouldn't have thought before. Just like Peter was like, hey, you know, you're the son of God. He's like, yeah, that thought, that, that came from your heavenly father. You know, I would encourage you, if you have that, unction to just say to just pause and say God what, what is what is it where what are you why are you causing me to pause what is what's the answer would you reveal truth in this matter because let me just say this the unction and the pause that isn't the answer that's just simply letting you know that you're on a direction you shouldn't be going and he has something else for you and to listen to that unction so number one is spirit number two his word is where he'll usually lead you he will usually lead you to his word. His word wasn't written to us, but it was written for us, and it is powerful. Paul wrote to Timothy in describing Scripture, saying this, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, all Scripture, it's inspired by God. It's useful. What does it do? It teaches us. It teaches us what's true. It makes us realize what's wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong, and it teaches us to do what is right. You know, as we're reading through the Bible, um, the New Testament together as a church, as many of you have joined us on the, on the Bible program, and as, uh, as we read through, I just love reading the comments. You know, this week somebody wrote, I, d I never knew that Satan had actually, you know, entered Judas before he betrayed Christ. And others were mentioning these different things. It's like, ah, ding, these little lights come on of, wow, I never knew that, but, but I've discovered it for myself. And I just think, how many things are yet to be discovered? So keep on reading, keep on studying, keep on growing. You know, I love how he brings things up in my life that I've studied decades ago. And he brings it up in my life because I need it in this moment. You know, the things that we've memorized, that he brings it back to our minds exactly for the moment that we need it. Do you know the truth is most of our, much of our culture goes against what we would read in, 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 the, in the word. Much of our culture goes against God's perspective. And they would say, you know, well, it's the Bible that goes against them. But let me just say his word was there first. If something's drifted, it wasn't his word. It was, it was us. And I would say for those who are weak in the word, you'll find yourself blinded by worldly perspectives. If you are weak in the word, you will find yourself blinded by worldly perspective. And so I just a reminder, a reminder to get into his word, a reminder to get his word in you, a reminder to memorize, uh, to continue to memorize. I love that, you know, we have one, one gal from our small group. She memorized all of Jude and it just took her a couple weeks. And then Lily was saying the other day, she's memorized 51 verses of John just simply by doing one a night. I think, man, you just started with one and now it's 51. 
51 verses about Jesus committed into our heart and spirit. That is going to come up sometime, and she's going to be glad she did. So what about you? You know, his spirit will help you hear his voice, his word. (laughs) It is his thoughts. It is his heart. And then finally, his wisdom. His wisdom. There's all kinds of wisdom out there. You know, we need to sort out what's godly wisdom and what's worldly wisdom. Romans chapter 1, Paul writes about the, the current situation of the world at that point. It isn't much different. He says, Romans 1.21, he's like, yeah, there's people that they knew God. They knew he existed, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him any thanks. And they began to think up these foolish ideas of what God was like. You know, God's just like, oh, I want him to be like this or I want him to be like this. And, you know, I think God's like this. And it says this, as a result. You know, I think God is okay with this, and I think God's okay, and and my God would be okay with this. He says, what happens in that? He says, as a result, their minds become dark. They become confused. They claim to be wise, and instead, they become utter fools. You know, the world's wisdom, it seems to be wise in the moment, but have we actually compared it to his wisdom? You know, the experts around us that give all of this advice, and it sounds wise, but have we compared it to his wisdom? And whose wisdom will we listen to once we compare them? Because it matters. You know, Solomon, who was known for being the wisest man of his time, and even to this day, recognized for his incredible wisdom, he wrote in Proverbs, he wrote this, let me just read, it's a little lengthy, but man, It grabs the heart. It's just simply talking about wisdom. Proverbs 1, verse 20, and he he personifies wisdom. It's like wisdom is like this this being that's, that's, that's speaking. Here's what he says, verse 20. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She's crying out in the public square. She's calling to the crowds along Main Street, to those who are gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers just relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come, come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you, and I'll make you wise. I've called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you, you paid no attention. You ignored my advice, and you rejected the correction that I offered. So I'll laugh at you. I'll laugh when you're in trouble. I'll mock when disaster overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm. When disaster engulfs you like a cyclone. And anguish and distress overwhelm you. When they cry for help, I won't answer then. Though they anxiously search for me, they won't find me then. For they hated knowledge. And they chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice. They paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me. They turn away from wisdom to their own death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. But all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. Man, I read that, and like, man, like wisdom, how could you be so, so heartless? How could you laugh at us when we're struggling? How could you? And, and wisdom is simply saying, I was there for you when you needed it because you needed wisdom in this moment so you don't end up in this one. And once you end up here, I can't help you anymore. There's no amount of wisdom that's going to get you out of here. And so why is it so important that we seek wisdom now? Because it matters. You know what wisdom is? Wisdom, like some people are like, well, what's wisdom? Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Basically, when you kind of break down the definition, that's what it comes to. You have all this knowledge. What do you do with that knowledge? Wisdom is the right use of it. The right use of it. Hosea actually wrote uh, in his letter, letter, he says, my people, he's talking about the people of God. Saying, God's saying it through Hosea. My people, they perish for lack of knowledge. They don't perish for lack of faith. They don't perish for lack of wisdom. They perish for lack of knowledge. He's like, they they don't know what they don't know. They don't know what they need to know. And the warning then and now is, don't reject his wisdom and knowledge now. Don't reject it in this point because you're going to need it. So how do I get that kind of wisdom? How do I get that kind? How do I get God's kind of wisdom in a world where there just seems to be wisdom everywhere? Here it is, number, number one, by trusting his spirit to lead you into truth. Like he said, I simply trust God that you're going to lead me. By your spirit from the inside, you're going to lead me into what's true. You know, secondly, by studying his word, but not just studying it, by being transformed by it. Like we said last week in, in Romans, 
that we wouldn't be conformed to this world, but we'd be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Lord, let, let my mind be changed by your word that I may choose, choose wisdom. And thirdly, you know, he says simply, you know, the brother of Jesus, James said, hey, if you lack wisdom, just ask God for it. James 1.5, just ask God for it. Can I say this, though? Just be like wisdom is the right use of knowledge, you need to have the knowledge in order to, to be able to use wisdom. You need to have the knowledge in order to be able to use wisdom. Some people are just like, ah, oh, you know, I just prayed about it, and I'm saying, so, so, I sort of felt something. And it's like, that's not wisdom. Wisdom is saying, hey, I did everything I knew to do. I researched, I studied, I looked for whatever I could find. God, I, this is the knowledge I have. Would you give me wisdom in my situation to use this to your glory and for my good? Would you give me, and it's like any father would do if their son asked them, yeah, I'll give you the wisdom you need. And then finally, fourth, get around wise people. Get around wise people. Solomon wrote in the Proverbs, Proverbs 13, 20, he said, he who walks with the wise becomes wise. If you're like, you know, I don't have time to research all this stuff that I'm, this decision that I need to make. I'm like, I haven't really thought, I haven't thought enough about it. Maybe I got to go ask somebody. You know, maybe you're a young person, you're like, you know, should I date this girl or not date this girl? Go ask somebody who's happily married and see what their advice might be for you. Because if they're happily married, believe me, they have figured something out that most of the world hasn't. You know, like, should I, should I buy this house or should I do this? Go talk to somebody who, you know, has wisdom in, fi- in the financial realm and find out. Find out what should you do. He who walks with the wise becomes wise. Proverbs eleven fourteen says, "In the multitude of counsel, there's safety." He need to say, you know, what? I got, ha, I got these decisions to make. <laughs> Let me ask a few other people and find out what do I hear, and then Lord, give me wisdom for for my situation. So the question tonight is, what wisdom are you following, and what wisdom are you using to make the decisions that you're making in life? And so, that being said, let's just go back to Peter and let's finish this off. You know, I think Jesus would be saying to Peter that uh, in this conversation, hey, Peter, you have the ability to think God's thoughts. You have the ability to know God's heart, to know his voice, to know his word. I mean, we just saw you do it. You know that question I asked, hey, who do you say I am? You, 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 n- home run, man. You nailed that one right out of the park. Like, you have the ability to. But just realize that you're also human. You have the ability to hear the enemy's thoughts as well and to, to, to decide which one you're going to choose. To not see things merely from a human perspective, but to just to, to think about that. So Jesus goes on to give an example of God's point of view to the rest of them. You know, the rest of them have kind of got brought, brought, brought back and they heard like Jesus like, not today, Satan. They're like, oh, you know, and then Jesus like, come on. I'll, 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 I'll. Peter and I were having a conversation here about, you know, God's, God's plans versus, you know, human plans. God's perspective versus human perspective. Let me let you in on what God's perspective looks like. And he says this. Verse 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you, and he says it to disciples, to people today, if any of you want to be my follower, he says, if you, if you think like Peter that, you know, all oh, the bad things aren't going to happen and whatever else, that, that's, not, that's not God. He's like, let me just clear this, clear, let me make it clear for you. If you want to be my follower, here's three things. You got to give up your own way. You got to take up your own cross and you got to follow me. That's totally counter to the culture that they were in. (laughs) That was not on their radar at all, and it's not on ours. But he's simply saying, you got to give up your own selfishness. You know, the the world around you, don't, John wrote and said, don't love the world or the things of the world. All it offers is the, you know, the lust of the flesh, like, oh, you know, I just, I got to feel all of that. Or the lust of the eyes, like, oh, I need to have that. Or the pride of life. Oh, look how good I've done. Look at all my amazing accomplishments. He's like, all that stuff's fading away. That's all it offers you. He says, you got to give up your own selfishness, your own self-seeking. It will lead to emptiness. He's like, take up your own cross. The cross was a place of suffering. He's like, to embrace suffering if it comes, you know, because of me, you got to take that up. You can't run from that. And as I read that, I'm like, oh, man, that... I'm, I'm like you. I don't want suffering, but I do want to be his follower. And then finally he says, and then follow me, which means obey me. Find out what God's perspective is and then do that. He goes on to say in verse 25, if you try to hang on to your life, fellas, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You know, if your whole life is all lived about trying to save your life or trying to extend your life or just trying not to die, Jesus is like, good luck. But I'm promising you, 10 out of 10, die. If that's what you're using your life for, you will lose in the end. 
you'll lose in the end. He simply says, if you lose your life for me, he's not saying if you die for me. That's not, that's not, the, that's not the thought here. He's like, if you will use your life, if you will live it for me and not for you, you'll actually save it in the end. You'll actually save it in the end. And so I think we should consider this. This kind of wisdom, this kind of thought of like, that's not necessarily the current narrative. But if we consider it, verse 26 says this, here's what Jesus' question is. When you, if you think that's a little bit strange or a little bit odd that he would say that, he says this in verse 26. He's like, well, what do you benefit? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? What, what good is it if you gain the whole world, which is like man's success, right? Like how much money can I make? How famous can I be? How many followers on Instagram and Facebook and whatever? How, how much can I do for me, me, me? He's like, what if you gained all that and in the end you lost you? What would you do? Is there anything worth more than your soul? And in the end, he's like, what would you trade for your soul? And I think the honest truth is we would probably trade all of that. There's no amount of money that would be worth more than my soul. There's no amount of like followers and applauders that would say, oh, you know, they, at that point, I'd be like, yeah, I don't need any of them if I can have my, my soul. So doesn't it make even common sense just to live based on his perspective rather than ours? I love Jim Elliott's quote. Jim Elliott lived this out and actually gave his life in his pursuit of God. And he said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep, his life to gain what he cannot lose. You know, I love how Jesus brings this to the table, but then finishes this conversation with this. Verse 27, he's like, fellas, let me just let you know what the end looks like. Here's what the end looks like, and here's what the end still looks like. No matter what today is like, this is what the end looks like. He says in verse 27, For the Son of Man will come with His angels in the glory of His Father, and He will judge all people according to His deeds. He's like, fellas, I am coming back one day, and it's going to be amazing. You just want to make sure you're on the right side of that because I'm coming in full power, full glory, riding that white horse, and there will be judgment after that. If you're on my side, there's no judgment. There's no condemnation because you're in Christ. But just make sure that you're on the right side. You know, and I would say this. In our culture, in our world, we're so, so concerned about the short-term effects. And maybe we're way too concerned about the short-term effects of our decisions. I know that's what he's dealing in my life with. But what about the long-term? Have we been making short-term decisions based on worldly wisdom that have long-term ill effects? Have we been listening for his leadership as his followers? Or have we just said we're followers but not really following? Have we been pouring over his words so that we would know his heart, his direction, his wisdom for us? Have we been like, or is it just like, no, you know, that's just the, you know, the, the book that Mark reads from sometimes. Or is it like, no, I got, I got to know it. Have you discussed the decisions that you have to make in life right now with other Jesus followers? Or are you just going solo? His design was never solo. It's why he called the church the gathering, that we would be in one another's lives. And I leave with this thought. If you're not a Jesus follower tonight, I think he just has one question for you. The God of the universe has one question for you. And I think it's similar to the conversation that he had with Peter. You know, he may say the same thing to you. You've heard what other people say about me. You heard what that guy on the screen says about me. You've, you've, you know what your friends and your parents think about me. But who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Have you answered that question? Have you ever thought about it maybe? Because I believe in this moment, this is not by accident that you're at this moment right now. Because the God of this universe truly loves you enough to put whatever needs to happen so that you would have the opportunity to answer that question. And why does it matter? Because we've all sinned, and we're all sinners, and we're all broken, and we cannot save ourselves, which means we need a Savior. There's a judgment coming for the sins in our lives, and that judgment is death. That those, are not, those are not just things that are real if you believe in them. They're, they're, they're real. That's why he's called us to share good news and that there's hope. Peter himself after these encounters with Jesus and seeing him raised from the dead, he said these words in Acts 4.12. He's like, there is salvation in no other name 
No other name. There's no other religion. There's no salvation in your own name. You can't do it for yourself. We cannot do it. It's like there's none, no other name under heaven whereby we might be saved except for the name of Jesus. Paul wrote to the Romans, just simply said, if you'd believe, if you'd believe in your heart and trust in your heart that Jesus is God and that God truly raised him from the dead, just like Peter said, that if you would confess with your mouth, if you would speak it out, that he and not you is now Lord and master of your life. He says you would be saved from the coming judgment on sin. That's good news for us. That is good news for us. And we stand at the end of our lives and we give an account to the God of the universe, whether you believe in him or not, that day is coming. That we'd be able to stand there boldly, boldly knowing we've been forgiven by Christ. We've been saved through Christ. That we have the chance to take a different path and that chance is here for you even in this moment. To say, you know what, I'm turning my back on everything that was past. And Jesus, I'm turning my eyes to you. I, I want to follow you. I will take salvation and grateful for it. Grateful for it. I'll take the hope that you have, the peace that you have, the joy that you have, the life that you have. I pray you take that decision and make that decision tonight. And I pray, Jesus followers, that you share his hope with the world around you. That is why we remain. That is why we remain at this time. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the good news of your gospel. Thank you that your word reaches our hearts. You've given us faith to reach out and trust you. Thank you, Jesus, for the price that you had to pay. Unbelievable, the price that you had to pay. But grateful that you did. Father, thank you for washing away sin, shame, guilt. Taking our fear, taking our cares. Thank you for the life you give us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you live in us. Pray that you lead and direct us, guide us, even in this day, as to what you desire for our lives. Lord, draw us to your word. Teach us from your word. Guide us to know what truth you desire for us. Help us to hear clearly hear clearly. God, I ask ask all of this in your name. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for for joining us, for listening to this, for for thinking about it, for pondering it. And, um, you know, I'd love for you to take a few more moments just on your own, or maybe you're gathered safely with some other people to just go over these questions, uh, to consider just to consider what he might be wanting to do in you. So here, we'll throw them up on the screen. We'll give you a chance in a minute to pause that. So number one, what jumped out at you from today's talk? What did you hear? I was like, oh, that, 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 that's something I need to think a little more about. You know, I always say your emotions. What's something that you're like, oh, that made me feel great. I, I need to look into that. Or what made me angry? And, and why did it make you angry? Because it's stirring something up in you. And that, that, that's his word. What, what was the purpose Second, in, in what ways do you see our culture trusting worldly wisdom? As you look around right now, and it doesn't matter if this is now or 2030 when this is watched, what's happening in your culture right now that you are like, man, they're trusting worldly wisdom? And to talk about that and think about that, and is there a godly wisdom in, in, you know, as a, in, in opposition to that? And then um, third, what decisions have you made that go against the wisdom of the world? What decisions have you made? So, you know what? There's been some things that I saw that, you know, I knew that that wasn't his wisdom. And so I chose the other way. And and how did that work out for you? And then finally, who do you say that Jesus is really? And that is across the board to the Jesus followers and those who are not yet. Who do you say that he is really? I pray this helps. I pray this helps you grow in your faith. I pray it helps you grow in your relationship with him and with others. And uh, just as always, Kingsway, my heart is for you. I love you. And uh, man, looking forward to uh, being with you again soon. Till then, stay in his word and keep on shining. We'll see you soon.